It's wonderful to be with all of you and thanks the organizer for putting this uh, together. Uh, I really am impressed by the global nature of this conversation, really bringing people from so many places in Europe, in US, uh, Africa and Asia. It's, it's really terrific. Um, <clears throat> I think that all of us, uh, since the students are already familiar with the topic, uh, we all agree that there has been a greening of religion in the last, uh, I would say, at least 60 years. Uh, I, yeah, that if, maybe we can even push it a little bit more. But um, despite the greening uh, uh, of religion, we still have uh, serious issues that we need to, uh, to deal with. And I will start first by just reminding us where we are, kind of, I always like to give students the, some visual representation of the challenges uh, ahead of us. And uh, that tells us that the problem is now, the problem is serious and it's all encompassing. And uh, we are all aware of climate change today. I don't think that anybody is not aware of it. So climate change, extreme weather events, uh, persisting droughts, uh, devastating wildfires, especially here in the, in the West of the United States. Uh, we have the problem of desertification, deforestation, loss of biodiversity, rising sea levels, depletion of food sources, pollution. All of those issues are very much with us. Uh, and I think it's important to mention, especially to the students, that world religions have not been indifferent from that. So uh, it's not that environmentalism just started in the last uh, decade or so. No, it started at least in the 1970s. Uh, and, the f and what we have is both an academic field, the field of religion and ecology. It also goes, also goes by other names. But we have on the one hand, the field of religion and ecology, but we also have um, religious environmental activism. And those two activities, the academic discussion and the activist uh, um, involvement or endeavor are, are, are quite separate from each other, at least in Judaism and at least in the United States. So we need to uh, keep that in mind. Uh, the two people that, uh, at least in the United States, are associated with the field of religion and ecology, Mary Evelyn Tucker and her husband, John Grimm. At the bottom of the screen, you see the series, the Harvard series of the uh, 10 volumes. Uh, I was asked to edit this volume. This is the volume on Judaism. I was not the organizer of the conference, but it's an interesting story and we may get to it in the conversation why I was asked to edit it, and it has to do with the complexity of being religious and being environmental uh, as in the Jewish tradition. So Jewish, Judaism has been present in this conversation from the very beginning, at least the academic conversation from the very beginning. But again, if you ask me um, how many Jewish environmentalists we are talking about, it's actually a very small number. So I will put the number of activists, it's no more than a few hundreds in the United States. Uh, some number even more or less in Israel, but in Israel it's a different story and I'll try to explain that as well. However, uh, the number of people who take activities organized by Jewish environmental um, in kind of uh, initiatives or programs or organizations, that number is higher. I estimate, and there are no good numbers, but my estimation is anywhere between 100 and 150,000, something like that. Um, but that's still a very small number. Now, none, nonetheless, uh, all strands of contemporary Judaism, reform, conservative, reconstructionist, Jewish renewal, orthodoxy, and Zionism, all of them have much to say about the environmental crisis. Actually, I was surprised to uh, find very recently that the first official statement from a Jewish organization came in 1966 a year before Lynn White Jr. said his famous speech, which then became the famous article, which is early 1967. So it's very interesting that Jews were aware of all the problems and I can explain why that's the case uh, if, we, if we get to it. 
So in terms of my work on, uh, on Judaism, uh, these are some of the things that I um, already wrote. This is the edited volume. Uh, those are my essays in uh, various reference books. If you want an overview of the field, you may want to take uh, a look at Judaism and the environment. That's the Oxford Bibliographies. It, it will give you everything up to 2015. But since then, a lot of new stuff came up, and I'm supposed now to update this essay which will take me some time. And this is my most uh, recent uh, discussion, but it's really the focus here is primarily on philosophies of nature rather than on Jewish environmentalism. So in terms of the structure of my talk, but the first, per the first part is ambiguity of Judaism, the complexity of talking about Judaism. Second part is the ethics of care and responsibility. And here I would say that you will find a lot of shared ground between the Jewish, the Muslim, and I would say the Christian. And then the last part is Jewish environment Mentalism. I'm not an I'm not an ethnographer, so I don't do this kind of research as my as the previous speaker does, but uh, or did. Uh, but um, I will tell you a little bit more about it. So part one is the ambiguity uh, of. Uh, Judaism. So we always have to start, unfortunately or unfortunately, I'm not totally sure. Uh, we have to start with Lynn Watch Jr.'s uh, famous talk with everybody in the field, since we're talking to people who already know the issues. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but what's fascinating here to me about this very short essay, how influential it was, and I interpret his work is kind of a prophetic uh, move that he was making, even though he's a lay Presbyterian, but he, he really wanted to bring us to look inside to see what we're doing wrong and to inspire us to do things differently. So we, there's so much literature about this sh short essay, uh, but the basic point here is that the, he saw the Bible and the Judeo Christian tradition based on the Bible as the cause of our ecological crisis. And in many ways that charge has inspired the field as it emerged. So what was uh, really problematic for him, uh, what's problematic as, as we all know is this famous uh, uh, verse or this important verse, how to interpret the, the meaning of what does it mean to master the earth or have dominion over the earth. In Hebrew, if you know the Bible in Hebrew, it's Reduha and there are various ways to interpret what that means, but clearly those two words, master and rule, those are the problematic, oops, the, okay, so master and rule, uh, those are the problematic terms that require uh, a lot of discussions. So when Jewish, um, when Jewish theologians, rabbis, educators began to join the conversation responding to the charge of Lynn White, they actually said that he's doing something unfair to the Bible. He's accusing the Bible, but he also forgets to pay attention to, to this verse, right? In this verse, the Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to till it and tend it. In Hebrew, it's, it's much more complicated. If you know Hebrew, uh, the words that are used there is le'ovda u le'shomra, to, and, and it actually is a reference to uh, the earth. So what does it mean? That's why it's in a female ending. But to till it and tending is one interpretation. You can uh, In one translation, you can translate also um, to care for it uh, and, and to observe it. So there are a lot of the, the word lavod I, I can explain it further if you know Hebrew, uh, why there's a lot of richness in that verse. But that basically became the verse that shows that the Bible is not about exploitation of natural resource. The Bible does not give license to humanity to exploit the resources of the earth, but rather the Bible gives a charge or a task for humanity to care for the earth. And it has been translated in the Christian tradition as the notion of stewardship. In Judaism, in the Hebrew Bible, we don't have the word steward, but that comes from the Greek translation of it. So that's the kind of the cause of that approach. But I would say that it's fair to say all three religious Abrahamic traditions share this notion of stewardship. You can call, you can call it ethics of care. You can call it stewardship. Um, I think it's with, regardless of the nuances, there's a lot in common. So what's the what's the problem with talking about the Bible? The problem is that the Bible doesn't speak in one voice. So this is an example, obviously. 
that we have different perspectives and we have to figure out how they relate. Um, also, the Bible has very different uh, literary genres and we have to understand each one on its own term. Um, in, in its own terms. And then the other complexity has to do with the fact that the Bible is a product of a particular historical context, historical, cultural, sociological context, but the Bible at the same time is also a response to that context. So that's the question. How do we interpret what is the relationship between humanity and nature according to the Bible? So um, if we emphasize the rebellion of the Bible against prevailing views, then we can see that the whole notion of creation, the doctrine of creation means that God is not part of the natural world. God is the creator of the natural world. And as such, as transcendent to the natural world, God is cannot be controlled by natural forces because God is the creator of those forces. And clearly God cares about the protection of nature that God has created. So... What happened next in the Jewish tradition there is this. The Bible is not Judaism to some extent. It's only the foundation of Judaism. Judaism evolved as interpretation of the biblical text. And what has emerged is rabbinic Judaism. And rabbinic Judaism evolved itself over time, at least from the first to the seventh century. That's the rabbinic movement that generated all the major texts, the Mishnah, the Talmud, the Midrashim, and so forth. But what is more important here is that the Bible, the rabbinic tradition created what I will call a text-centered culture or bookish culture, a culture that focuses on the ideal of learning. Uh, and as a result, there is a certain uh, distancing from the natural world because the focus is not on what is the physical environment and how to understand it or how to interact with it, but rather how to interact with the biblical text. So the two pictures here are obviously from 19th century representation of Jewish rabbinic culture. Uh, and that is part of a problem which was defined or analyzed quite uh, interestingly by the next person I'll show you in the next slide. But before we get to it, that the meaning of um, the relationship between humanity and nature in the rabbinic Judaism and in post-rabbinic Judaism during the medieval and early, period, early modern period uh, is quite complicated. I argue, but not everybody agrees with me on that, that there has been a textualization of nature, that nature became a text that has to be interpreted. And it was, I'm giving you here three types of interpretation of the uh, at what is nature and how humanities relate to nature. So the German pietist in the 12th and 13th century looked at nature as basically a text that tells you something about God's hidden will. And the goal of the believers to fathom or unpack or penetrate the, the hidden will of the divine. And um, there's quite a new work about that. If you want, I'll give you some references if you're interested. The, the philosophers from Spain and a little bit in Italy as well uh, developed a different approach to nature, much more focused on the intelligibility of nature, the regularity of nature, the orderliness of nature, and the fact that you can uh, interpret nature by using uh, contemporary science, which at the time meant Aristotelianism or Neoplatonized Aristotelianism. And the mystics, the Kabbalists, they looked at the uh, natural text as a mirror of God, as a symbolic text that enables the believer to participate and really literally take part in the inner life of God. I won't, I won't be able to unpack all this for you, but this, in my view, creates the problem that was identified by this person, by Stephen Schwarzschild, who was a reformed Jewish rabbi, uh, German origin, of course, became the editor of uh, Judaism. And he wrote in 1984, in the beginning of the environmental movement, he wrote this text, uh, this essay, uh, which created a lot of controversy. And, and, but he put his finger on the right problem. He called it the unnatural Jew. Namely, he sees a certain um, discrepancy between Judaism and nature or between being Jewish and being part of the natural world. And he gave us uh, both historical reasons, historical factors, why that is a problem. And the, the, the real issue is the urbanization of the Jews, the fact Jews were not allowed to own land or cultivate land. And that created a certain distancing. But I think that the theological factors are even more important. The fact that Judaism looked at everything, not in terms of sanctifying what is, and telling us that what is, is all there is, but rather thinking about what is from the perspective of what ought to be. 
So that perspective, that, that kind of focus, that ethical perspective is what Judaism is all about, according to him. Uh, and he actually told us, kind of spoke rather critically about the environmental movement. Uh, they didn't stay quiet because one person uh, who wrote a famous essay also on the nature in the Bible, um, she actually argued that this essay should not have been published because it's too it's too wrong. But uh, I won't get into all the details, but here is, I need to move a little bit faster. So here it is in the, uh, if in the, Early modern period or pre-modern period, we have a distancing of Jews from nature. Zionism is the modern movement that attempted to change all that, but bringing the Jews back to nature, not only bringing them back to the land of Israel to end the exile, to end the diasporic situation and to create a new culture, but also create a new Jew, a new Jewish body, a new Jewish body politics that is going to be rooted in the natural world, focusing on agriculture, really uh, reimagining what the relationship between the Jew and the uh, natural environment uh, could be. So what happens here, I, what, this is what I mean by secularized Judaism, a lot of the, the passion, the depth, the I, kind of the, the longing, the issues that explain Zionism are all religious, but they were secularized by the Zionism. And just because I didn't mention it, but if you are not familiar with the history of Zionism, Zionism began really in the 1880s. Uh, and 1948, we have the state of Israel. So everything that happened since is the, pro is the result of Zionism, but not exactly as it was imagined. So Zionism in many ways was a great success. So we have political sovereignty for the Jews after a uh, long time of uh, being devoid of it. We have a strong army. I don't know if it's good or bad. You can argue both ways. Uh, global impact, industrialization, urbanization, high standard of living. Israel is a very successful modern state, but everything comes with a price in life, right? So this is the price. The price is um, we, ha we have really some very you know, exceedingly successful modern state, highly technologically oriented and so forth. A lot of pop population density, very high population density, bad, bad, bad congestion. They're trying to alleviate it a little bit right now, but it's really, really difficult. Serious pollution issues, loss of open spaces, coastal erosion, all those are problems. And that's really what inspired the environmental movement in Israel. So, so now I'm gonna explain the next in the next part, I will explain why, what are some of the problems. So if you're gonna be an environmentalist, you cannot really talk just about what the land of Israel uh, needs in order to deal with environmental problem. You have to, it's an, a very similar question came up in the end of the previous session. Kind of if you're gonna say something about it from a Judaic perspective, you've got to deal with religious values. So where do you go? You have to go to the Bible. That's always the beginning of it. And if I look at Jewish and Judaic environmental ethics kind of generally, uh, what can I uh, generalize about it? These are some of the things that seem kind of pertinent to me. So it's necessarily religious. Uh, it doesn't mean that you cannot be a secular Jew and be an environmentalist. You can, of course you can, many are. But if you're going to justify it, you have to use the religious culture, the religious tradition that under, undergirds Jewish existence, if I should say. So not everybody would agree with me on, uh, on that score, but to me, it's necessarily religious. It's also inseparable from law. You cannot talk about Judaic ethics without talking about what you need to do because the Torah, which means divine instruction, literally the Torah tells you what to do. So um, it's always engaged in a legal structure. Uh, it's also about, it's also inherently relational. It's about covenantal relationships between Israel and God, between the Israelites themselves, in, in other words, Jew and another Jew, and between the human being and the natural world. So everything has to do with relationship. It's also concerned, and that's similar to the point we heard about the Islamic tradition. It engages down-to-earth issues, so all down-to-earth issues. It could be food, it could be sex, it could be economic issues. It's all related to, oh, it all has a religious significance. 
And what's unique here, which I think is the foundation of the entire Abrahamic tradition, three Abrahamic traditions, is the causal connection between social justice and the fecundity of the earth. If we are morally corrupt, then there will be corruption in the natural world. You can It can go uh, one without the other. And in some ways, as some environmentalists today say, such as Arthur Wasco, the corruption of our economic system manifests itself in the corruption of the natural world. So in terms of biblical environmental principles, this is, I have a lot of information in the full text, but I will have to go pretty, uh, just just uh, kind of uh, <clears throat> in a very uh, skimpy way, just to tell you some of the themes, and we can talk about it if you want more information. But I would say that uh, biblical environmental uh, principles always begin with this assumption that we are not the owners of the earth. God is the owner, of, the rightful owner of the earth. We are just temporary tenants here, and we have to we have to do the best we can to protect that which doesn't belong to us. So it seems to me that the doctrine of creation is actually a very very good. Uh, point of departure for the three Abrahamic traditions in terms of environmental mindedness or environmental mindfulness, it's a better word. Uh, protection of biodiversity is, ident you can find in the biblical text, especially in Genesis, the notion that God created uh, different species, they didn't use that word, of course, that comes from an Aristotelian tradition, but they had a concept of separation between types of things that exist can so uh, God created the world min leminehu according to its various kinds and the goal of the human or the task of the human is to protect this speciations we would call it or to protect diversity to protect the fecundity of the earth this is a very important actually some people claim that it's the major contribution of judaism to the environmental discourse prohibition on wanton destruction it's called the, the doctrine or the principle of baltashri do not destroy but i'm going to go to the next uh, slide for a second just to show you uh, no, it's not. It's this one here. So Baltashchit, uh, they translate as avoid damage to nature. That's that's exactly what it really means. It's based on a particular reading of Deuteronomy 2019, what to do with uh, fruit bearing trees in times of siege and how to protect them. But I want to bring to your attention, this is a cover of a new book, uh, Waste Not by Tanhum Yore which is his translation of Baltashrit. It's a better translation, but it, it focuses only on waste issues. But in truth, the Baltashrit principle is much uh, broader than that and includes all sorts of destruction, not just wastefulness. So there are a lot of, uh, a lot of legislation developed, especially in, in, in the Talmud, in, uh, in, according to this principle. This is a kind of a seal, uh, a chazon seal of approval, if you wish. It's, uh, it's, it's a particular way of linking the tradition of do not destroy, the principle of do not destroy to environmental activism or environmental correct behavior such as reduce, reuse, recycle. So it's a wonderful uh, illustration of how you can adapt a traditional value to contemporary environmental concern. So let's go back here. Um, in addition to that very important contribution, we have a, the principle of Tsar Baale Chaim, Namely, you have to prevent suffering or unnecessary distress for any living creature. But of course, for in the tradition, it was primarily for domestic animals. And then today we extend that to farm animals or to um, what happens in labs, because in labs, there's a lot of misuse of animals. So what, how can this principle help us determine what to do in labs? Uh, the concept, uh, so I can I can just go to the next, uh, just to show you this. So this is just to illustrate that he's an environmental, Jewish environmentalist, and that is, it speaks for itself. But we have a lot of... Uh, and the Jewish environmental dis discourse began with books like this one, Animal Kingdom, Jewish Thought, basically what the Jewish tradition says about animals. Uh, this is a reference to Jewish vegetarians in America. Actually, the organization was created by an Orthodox Jew, Richard Schwartz, who uh, really believes that vegetarianism is what the Bible really what the Bible had denied, and we should all be vegetarians if we are connect if we are in any way concerned about biblical approach. So to go back here, kashrut, the kosher system, everybody knows about that. That itself puts limits on what humans can consume. Um, and I think that um, what's interest here 
is the, the idea that it's not enough what you put, to think what you put in your mouth, what you eat and what you don't eat, but also how you produce that which you eat. So I'm going to get you in, a, in uh, let, let, actually, let's, let's do it right now. We can go to this idea, how environmentalists today interpret kashrut, and they created the term eco-kashrut. So kashrut that is connected to ecological concern. This is Zalman Shachter Shalomi, uh, one of the visionaries of the Jewish environmental movement. Uh, he is a very interesting person. Who, he was the teacher of this person, Arthur Waskow, who is the leader of Jewish environmentalists uh, to, in America. Uh, Shachter Shalom is already deceased. Uh, Arthur is also getting very kind of old. He's getting, he's 90 almost, and uh, will not be with us for too long. So, but they created this concept of eco kashrut And the idea here is that how you produce things has to be done with justice. So if you're going to use, if you have a plant that, that takes, that uh, makes kosher food, in other words, slaughters animals in a particular way that is kosher. But if you use child labor in that plant, then the food is not really kosher, even though technically it is, or ritually it is, but uh, spiritually, ethically, it shouldn't be considered kosher. So they really expanded the concept of kashrut greatly and many environmentalists, Jewish environmentalists today who are religiously concerned and committed, they operate under this uh, principle. So let's go back to the rest of the principle. There's concern for future generation. That's what happened. You know, the Bible has a text about what happens when you bump into a nest with uh, the mother, mother hen and the chicks. You can take the chicks, but you cannot kill the mother. And some people already in the 13th century interpreted that Nachmanides already interpreted it as concern for future generations. So I already mentioned this idea of social justice and eco-justice in the concept of eco kashrut but a lot of the legislation, especially the legislation of the sabbatical year, uh, illustrate that uh, uh, approach. Um, you always have to worry about and take care of and be concerned about the, the poor and the widow and the orphan, the socially marginal, those who are weak in the society. And you have to figure out a system that helps them survive in their, even under uh, terms of scarcity. The Sabbath, we celebrate it today. The Sabbath is an important principle because we are not producing anything. Uh, we do consume things in the Sabbath, but we don't produce. We, there's no work, at least for, not for religious uh, Jews. There isn't. If you're not religious, if you're a secular Jew, then you sell, you don't even uh, do anything special on the Sabbath. But uh, it is, I, I would say, one of the really important contributions of Judaism to the concept that we can rest. We are supposed to rest. And rest is not part of nature. We impose rest. The divine law imposes rest on nature. Today, some people interpret this in terms of what to do about technology. The notion of digital Sabbath has become quite popular when people disconnect themselves from technological devices in order to really truly rest. The Sabbath principle was extended to the sabbatical year and the Jubilee. And there's a whole uh, slew of legislation. It's very complicated, actually, I would say to live by the laws of the sabbatical year. And it's not really true to what, and not really clear to what extent it was actually observed or not actually observed. Was it just an ideal or more than just an ideal? But we already know that in the rabbinic period, the sabbatical institution, sabbatical year institution, the Shemitah was actually reinterpreted, uh, especially in regard to debt relief because there's supposed to be debt relief on the Shemitah. So what to do? Well, you have to create mechanism, legal mechanism that will protect the creditor, not just the debtor. And that became a big issue for the rabbis. They created that mechanism. We can talk about it in the discussion, but the sabbatical year today, and we'll see it in a, in a, in a few seconds and a few slides, uh, is inspiring to many environmentalists, both in the United States and in the diaspora, especially in the United States, to live by, to at least live by the principles of the sabbatical year. So I look at it more as an inspiration than just practice, although some Orthodox Jews do practice the sabbatical year. So this is just an overview of the structure, of the intellectual structure of Jewish uh, what I would call ethics of care and responsibility. 
I will just uh, add the second part by referring to this value. You may have heard about it. These are three very, there are many uh, online, you can find many uh, visual representations of the principle of tikkun olam. Literally, it means repair of the world. It comes from a uh, very ancient prayer of the Jewish tradition that uh, really compels every Jew, let the ken olam be malchut shodai, namely to repair the world to make it fit for the kingdom of God, but this in the form, this form of a noun, this is a possessive form, uh, that came only in 16th century Kabbalistic texts, uh, actually from the land of Israel, but this became a very important principle for Jewish mystics in the early modern period, especially 16th century, but it has been now secularized so that a lot of environmentalists, actually, if you ask them why you engage in environmentalism, they're going to say it because we are interested in making the world a better place. We're interested in the repairing of the world. So that justifies all sorts of social activism, but including environmental activism, including climate advocacy. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the notion of caring for other people. You can see here, those are some of the things that people mention when they talk about uh, tikkun olam. So it's volunteering, doing good deeds, of repairing, of loving, loving kindness, being responsible, being interconnected. All of these cluster of ideas fall under this concept of tikkun olam. So with this, I would like to move to the last part, which is uh, a little tell you a little bit about Jewish environmentalism, and I'll divide it between Israel and the diaspora. So starting with Israel, what's interesting here is that you have a governmental ministry. There's a governmental ministry. I think in 1984, this ministry was established, but the movement started before 1954 it started, or 1952 even. Uh, but Israelis in, re recognize that some of the projects of Zionism were mistaken from an environmental perspective. So they, for example, the drying up of the Hula Valley wetlands was a terrible mistake, and they've tried to uh, recover that as a result. The organization that was responsible for the beginning of environmentalism in Israel is this one, Society for the Protection of Nature. And I think I have a slide, the next slide. Yeah, here are some of the... Uh, of their activities. So this is an example of how they actually dealt with a problem and they came up with a solution. And today the wetlands in the north part of Israel have been restored. Uh, and, and, you know, this is an example of, of <laughs> some of the environmental successes in Israel. In the early parts, and still they still exist to this day, uh, they were primarily interested in hiking. Uh, hiking was a way to tie the Israelis to the land, kind of through the feet, so to speak. And that also has a very interesting history, how it actually came from German youth movement practices in the beginning of the 20th century. So we can talk about that. But I'll go back here. So Israel also has uh, two parties. Of course, in Israel, you always have parties, but you don't have agreement among the parties. So why, why we need to have two green parties, I don't know. But there's a slight difference between them. They're both non-religious parties, uh, but uh, they have failed to really enter into the Knesset. But right now, one Israeli environmentalist is in the Knesset, is in the parliament, but uh, he's in the context of another uh, party. So here are two other organizations that illustrate kind of uh, environmental environmentalism in Israel originally was secular. So this is these are two early environmental movements from the 70s and early 80s, and they're primarily about quality of life, recognition that public health is connected to the environment, but also some issues of rights, of human rights, civil rights are connected to environment. So these two organizations deal with those kind of issues. Uh, so here is, yeah, that's another kind of variation of the same thing. I would like to introduce you to this idea of, of religious environmentalism in Israel. I call them post-secular, but I don't know that they will even use that term to describe themselves. But these are all, the three of them, these three on the, on the right, uh, they are all American Jews that came to Israel in the 1980s, early 90s. This is Alon Tal, who is now in the Israeli parliament. This is Elon, oops, sorry about that, I, I didn't. This is Elon Schwartz, uh, and this is Jeremy Benstein. They, uh, these two created the Heschel Center, the Heschel Sustainability Center, Markaj uh, Heschel Kayamut, and they are exemplary, really exemplary, how you interpret the biblical 
tradition or take the entire Judaic tradition and translate it into environmentalism. It's they've done wonderful work, both intellectual work, but at work on the ground through leadership, through education. And that's ultimately what environmentalism is about. It's primarily about education, but also their work and also his work are tied to social issues, a lot of social issues that need to be taken care of. And it's done with connected to the environment. This woman is an Israeli born woman. And her name is Einat uh, Kramer. And she's the uh, founder and she's the leading force behind this movement. Uh, this organization called Teva Ivri, they translated it into Jewish nature, but it's actually, literally speaking, it's Hebraic nature or Hebrew nature. And it's interesting why they chose the word Jewish rather than the word Hebrew. I don't know. Uh, they did it probably for PR purposes, I guess, but it's a fascinating issue. Anyway, this woman is spearheading the revival of the Shemitah practice of the sabbatical year in Israel today. And she's a fascinating lady. And uh, we can talk more about her and how these people who speak the language of Judaism, but attend to all the environmental issues that face Israel today. So here is, this is the Israeli Shemitah project that she's leading, that's those two are connected. This is a, a, an Orthodox Jew who actually lives according to the laws of Shemitah and actually follows those laws so in the seventh year you don't do anything to the land you just let it lay fall, fallow uh here is a sign that says here we observe shmita and uh, here we have the sabbatical year so you can be an orthodox jew and live according to the shmita but in truth most of them especially the project of kind of spearheaded by Teva Ivri, they really want us to think about Shemitah, to interpret it for our own life, especially in an anti-consumerist, anti-capitalistic and anti-technology kind of way. Uh, when we go to the United States, these are just the uh, tip of the iceberg. Um, I should actually, let me go back to this and remind you, or let me uh, not remind, but tell you that Israel, if I can even, even go to this uh, slide, Israel has 140, about 140 environmental organizations in a country that is 9 million strong <laughs> and not most of, and many of them don't really care or are involved in environment it's, it's an incredible number i uh, you know as opposed to let's say in arizona we barely barely have two organizations or maybe three and we are seven millions here in arizona so this is just to tell you how uh environmentally involved people are in israel in the united states I gave kind of, I organized them in a particular way here. So this COGIL is Coalition of Environment and Jewish Life. It started in 1993, and it was the early umbrella organization of all people interested in uh, environmentalism in America, Jewish environmentalism in America, uh, very involved in the legislation and in pressure on the government, especially in in the House and the Senate, and they've done some marvelous things because they had congressmen like Henry Waxman involved in it and Barbara Boxer as a senator, so they were very influential. They are not as influential today. They're, they, they kind of lost, lost ground, lost leadership, and so forth, and usually there's a money issue. The main organization today is this one, Chazon. Chazon means vision. So Chazon, Jewish Lab for Sustainability, they basically are now over kind of including other two organizations that were originally separate. So this is the primary organization in America. If you want to be environmentalist, you probably know in Chazon. So let me just show you in the next slide, the kind of activities that Chazon is, is uh, engaged in. It's very similar to what we've heard in the previous lecture, bike rides. Um, food movement has to do with uh, farm to table, uh, that farm to table movement, but a lot of it of course has to do with kosher issues. Uh, eco kashrut issues. Climate activism is the hottest issue today, but it's um, also not probably not as not more than number two issue, which is food. Uh, they do a lot of leadership training. They do a lot of uh, inspired <clears throat> learning. They have to teach people how to read the Jewish sources and how to interpret them in regard to environmentalism. They're very interested in the Shemitah project, which we are now in the Shemitah year. This year is the Shemitah year. And uh, they teach quite a lot about that. They're very concerned about Jewish, uh, about social justice, and of course, about spiritual practice. Uh, if you look at this one, here it says environmental tshuva. Tshuva means repentance. So that's what we're all, you know, kind of supposed to engage in. So we get to climate activism in a few more slides. But 
uh, if uh, what I kind of like is the similarity between the way these young people look, which are very interested in sustainability. Uh, this particular group is also interested in climate change, uh, and it's an operating and it's an initiative under Chazon, and they look exactly like the the Muslim youth or the Christian youth. If you're going to look at other pictures, so it's absolutely fascinating to see how, in terms of activities, it's all the same. Uh, climate advocacy is the hottest thing today. We have new organizations. A lot of this protest, a lot of it is to the, uh, the assumption is that this is a moral issue, not just technical issue or technological issue. And you have to deal with poverty, race, gender issues that are all connected. Uh, so that's uh, climate advocacy. And then uh, there's a focus on the future, on the youth movement. Uh, so again, here are some of the pictures that tell you uh, what we are all supposed to do uh, if we are members, let's say, of uh, Jewish Youth uh, for Climate Change. I'm giving you some of the pictures here. Again, we don't have the time to unpack it, but some of them could be, you can say, like these three started from a more secular and philosophical perspective. These are all philosophers, environmental philosophers. These people, I would say here, uh, are more kind of what I would call the post-secular, these two are actually eco-feminists. Uh, I can tell you a lot about them. Uh, some of the people here are more toward Hasidic or what they call neo-Hasidic ways of being Jewish and it's all environmentally uh, concerned. So religion, the religious and the secular are intertwined. And if I'm gonna look at an assessment, so I would say uh, the big question is the question of the secularity. Is it secular, is it religious or is it post-secular? I think a lot of it is post-secular, but I have to recognize the other ones. Uh, who are the Jewish environmentalists? That's a question. Um, what makes one a Jewish environmentalist? What kind of activities? So we can talk about that. What is the social impact? That came up in the conversation at the previous session. What is the social impact? Uh, I can tell you more. I, see, I think it's it exists and it's present. It's identifiable, but I agree that it's not profound. Uh, the mainstream is still not, and it's environmentally aware, but not necessarily environmentally engaged. What are the main challenges? Uh, are the main challenges has to do primarily with funding. So funding is a problem. There is instability of many organizations because of lack of funding. And then how can we address the challenge? And my answer is we can address the challenge by moving into more interfaith environment, uh more kind of getting to be involved jews getting to be involved with non-jewish organizations especially in the united states for christian but also muslim and if i tell jewish organizations that they have to do business with muslim organizations it's not going to be so easy for me to make the case so uh it's it's an issue uh, if i look at it as a lifelong education that's the that's the challenge urban farming can be done more and more Jews are involved, no, it's, it's too strong a statement, but there are Jews now involved in farming, but we can do it in terms of uh, urban gardens and, and gardens and congregations. We can support environmental organizations. We can put public pressures on governments and, 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 and uh, government officials on all levels, and we should be part of the environmental humanities. So why should we do about, uh, why should we go in that direction? Because I think all of my, all three Abrahamic traditions really share the same thing. And that's the belief in the doctrine of creation. And that's if we are, if we take it seriously, that implies or that entails caring for God's word. I, I, I love that that picture. You're all from, familiar, of course, with the Laudato Si movement. Uh, and I think that in terms of what we actually do, we do more or less the same, if not exactly the same. So it, we express it differently. We have different visual images, but the spirit is the same. And that's where I would like to thank all of you for your attention. So thank you very much.